Alright, hello and welcome to another video by Flash Jazz Cat. Now you might recognise this machine from a previous video, this is the Atari 130XE which came from Canada with uh, VBXE and Rapidus, primarily with uh, video issues and we, we took it apart in the uh, prior video about this computer and we identified uh, a number of problems uh, with connectors falling off and uh, some problems with the grounding on the uh, the video connector at the back here, the RGB video connector. The, the machine produced very dark RGB video which was actually caused by an inline resistor in the SCART cable and we uh, discovered that the SCART cable itself is for a, uh, an Apple IIGS machine. The Apple IIGS presumably needs uh, these inline resistors on uh, RGB switch and I think is it the blanking pin on the SCART connector uh, but they're not needed with uh, VBXE and indeed will cause problems with uh, dark video and that kind of thing. So we took those resistors out of the cable. We added uh, audio on SCART as well. Yes, I ended up taking pretty... Um, the machine basically worked at the end of the last video but the wires kept falling off and that kind of thing. So um, I basically rewired the whole thing. So let's have a look inside and I'll show you what I've done. And we can compare it with uh, how it looked when it arrived. I go into quite a lot of detail in this video uh, describing what I did to this machine uh, when it came to rewiring and that sort of thing. Uh, so if, you, uh, if you're if you interested in that, that's great. But if you, if you don't want to watch that and you want to skip straight ahead uh, to where I discover finally um, the uh, sleeper issue that was still creating problems even after all that work was done and then we get into testing the machine and showing what it can do and playing with the Aki keyboard interface and side 3 etc. Skip to the time code that I've flashed up on the screen. Okay so let's get into the machine, pop the keyboard off. I also um, fixed the power light. The problem with the power light was that the contacts, um, the carbon contacts on the back of the LED weren't pushing onto the mylar quickly enough and this screw had stripped in the frame completely when presumably when the mylar was swapped, the new mylar was put in. So I just put a bigger screw that would bite into the plastic and that actually keeps the thing sandwiched together sufficiently well so that the light works. So yeah, so here we are. So this is what it looks like now. I'll put in the video, I'll put a before and after sort of side by side thing. Now I know cosmetics aren't the be all and end all of course. What, what's important is that the thing works and is reliable. Um, but as you can see, it's quite a drastic amount of work being done here. And it's now got an Aki uh, keyboard adapter fitted uh, which I'll go into in a bit later on and I'll show you how that works as well that's pretty cool this one's by Candle Sin uh, designed uh, comes from Lotharic and uh, appears to work really well but as I say I'll show you later on about that so we'll just go around the board we'll start the top right right top right of the board if you've watched the previous video if you haven't go and watch the previous video it'll put everything into context here I've completely rewired this DB15 RGB connector and uh, I've made a correction to it as well. Now the reason in, in the previous video I pointed out that the on-screen display on my monitor didn't recognize that there was a SCART cable connected at all. But it'll still uh, put the signal through if you actually select it. But it was actually grayed out and the reason so there was the cable detect wasn't working at all. So there's the cable at the SCART end. Now you've got some grounds on here. Blue ground, green ground. Oh. Yeah anyway there's the RGBs are there. They've each got a ground next to them. There's a ground on the end here as well, and there's a one between the two audio channels on the top. Now, the, the audio ground wasn't connected, so I've jumped at that from one of the other grounds, because we're not doing individual grounds on RGB here with the Atari. There's just no provision for that. Uh, so they're all common. Now, this one here is tied to the shield, and the shield was completely unconnected at either end. It had continuity to the the chassis but that was a floating that was not connected to anything so as soon as I I just picked off one of the grounds here the ground pins and I've soldered that to the uh, shield so now when we plug this cable in the monitor detects that there's a SCART cable connected because that pin is shorted the ground and everything works as it should and I don't know if uh, connecting that audio ground well the ground is between the two audio inputs will help with audio quality because the, the owner was complaining of a kind of a low hum so that, anyway that's the uh, video connector obviously we've got this Aki interface as well with the USB connector 
which we'll go into probably later on. So likewise with uh, Rapidus, um, rewired Rapidus. There's only three wires, but they look a bit smarter now. Now I've put an extra socket on the stack of sockets under Rapidus because it was just sitting too low and it was hitting the back of the chassis here, the back of the casing rather. And obviously if the board hits the casing at the back, it's not going to sit properly in the socket stack. So that was on its own enough to create serious problems because it's a CPU. Now VBXE, I think uh, of, of everything in this machine, this was the most challenging thing of all. Um, and I think most of the stability problems came from um, the wiring on this VBXE and the adapter underneath and the antic socket on the motherboard. I'll flash up a reminder of what was in the board. For some reason there was no frame on the socket, the precision socket, underneath the antic chip or underneath the antic adapter. And a couple of the legs were a bit high there so I leveled them all off. That didn't really fix the problem. What we had was the machine would turn on, it would spontaneously lose RGB video output or it would just crash. Uh, and this D2 light would variously go out. At one point I, I was driven to actually doubt the, the VBXE itself so I thought I'd try a spare and I was pretty sure I had a, a spare that used the the more modern pin arrangement on the back here uh, where there's male pins on the on the VBXE itself and a female receptacle on the adapter and I did have one but unfortunately it's dead so uh, that didn't get very far I didn't want to rip one out of another machine particularly if I could avoid it um, but anyway so I replaced that weird looking uh, frameless socket on the motherboard with a proper socket. Now the last job that I did on this uh, yesterday was the uh, Aki keyboard interface as I mentioned before and while I was uh, rewiring connectors and putting the Aki uh, adapter in I removed those uh, SIO, those FCC mandated SIO capacitors uh, that were grounded in a horrible, two horrible lumps of solder on this uh, part of the board here. So they've been removed and uh, they'll uh, prevent high speed SIO from working correctly so they've come off as well the whole thing looks a hell of a lot neater in the process uh, so that yes that is basically uh, the roll call of things that were done on this machine so let's uh, put it together and give it a test so actually uh, I was busy editing this video and shooting some extra footage at the same time uh, when I ran into so many problems with this machine that I actually had to stop what I was doing. Uh, this was Friday, actually, when I was uh, busy working on the video. I actually had to stop what I was doing and uh, go completely back to basics here because the machine was still losing the VBXE signal even after all the fixes that I'd done to it that I've described earlier in the video. I switched it on today. Uh, at one point I was using the machine because it uh, exhibited a few problems with side 3 some of which were uh, correctable in software so this machine is very useful uh, in that respect even when I took Rapidus out of the board I had the same uh, problem so I can't blame Rapidus for anything that's going on uh, with this machine at the moment at all it seems to be working uh, very well but there is one problem which could possibly be my fault that I ran into which I'll talk about in a bit but anyway, I took Rapidus completely out of the machine, so all that was left uh, was the VBXE and the Aki. I even disconnected the Aki at one point, because I actually lost SIO at one point with this machine. So yeah, I was pretty, uh, I was pretty dumbfounded actually. I was at the point of giving up, because I've been working on this since uh, Thursday now. So this is day four. So I'm going to show you. I found out what the problem is, the main problem with this machine that was causing the bulk of the problems. I'll show you what it was. I didn't take a picture of it unfortunately but I will show you what was wrong. Right so I'll pop the keyboard off and I'll take the VBXE out of the board which I'm not too worried about doing now because when I know when I put it back together it's still going to work. As you may remember if you watched the, uh, the previous video um, this wire here is the uh, D6 address line uh, for the VBXE and you can connect that to two different pins depending on whether you want the VBXE hardware to show up on page D6 or D7 and, uh, on ultimate one megabyte systems that's switchable so you connect that to the VB pin uh, on the ultimate one megabyte but we haven't got ultimate one megabyte here so it's going straight to uh, 74LS138 I think it is right so now 
there was a couple of problems with this wire. Firstly, that connector didn't grip onto the pin properly, so it kept falling off. <laughs> Secondly, uh, on video, this end of the wire fell off. It didn't snap, it just the soldering came straight off the chip. So I fixed that, and uh, you'd think with two problems, problems at either end of that wire, I basically eliminated that from uh, the list of possibilities. It couldn't be the D6 signal. Um, so I ended up replacing the Andix socket. I ended up even putting extra solder on the legs of the desoldered Andix chip so it would sit more firmly in this adapter here. Tried a different adapter. I've been all over this board trying to figure out what the hell was wrong with it. Now, today, when the problem occurred again, so what we had was, as soon as I turned the machine on, I'd either get no video, uh, the machine sometimes wouldn't boot at all, or I'd get video for a second and then the D2 light would go out and the VBXE video would cut out and I still had legacy video. But this afternoon it just got to the point where the thing wouldn't come on at all. And uh, yeah, I was completely exasperated. Now, for some reason, I flipped the board over just to have a look at the connector. And as I say, I didn't take a picture of this and I'm very, very uh, regretful that I didn't, but never mind. Right, so the pin in question is this one at the front here. So we've got a, a four-way pin header, which was soldered on, I believe, after the fact, because I don't think the uh, board as manufactured comes with any pin headers on it at all. Or at the most, it comes with these ones here for the RGB header, but typically now they come with no pin headers on them at all. So I can only assume that the person who installed the board put this header on it, and they also had to break off this pin here. I mean, the other three are unused in normal circumstances anyway, so that's no problem. You removed that because it wouldn't clear repeaters, although it would now because I've raised repeaters up. Um, now I had a look at these solder joints here, and what we actually had was rather than these, well, they're not the best in the world now, but I mean, it does the job, um, rather than these little domes here, what we actually had was sort of little balls of solder that were resting on top of the pins. Uh, it just hadn't it just hadn't been heated up enough when it was uh, attached to the board, so the solder hadn't flowed through all of the vias properly, and specifically it hadn't flowed through the via on the front pin at all. And of course, I know these um, vias have probably got plate through on them, but nevertheless, I'm not even certain that the trace is on the top of the board or the bottom. I'm not sure, but in this case. It clearly wasn't making pro proper contact, the solder just hadn't flowed into that hole. And that <clears throat> is all it was, because when I reflowed this uh, connector here, just give it a quick... I just wicked it quickly and heated it up again. Nothing special. The problem completely went away. Now, the reason I know this is a fix and not a fluke is because another issue that the owner had complained of is that the SVBXE driver, uh, which the owner wanted to use in Sparta DOS X to give himself an 80 column display, occasionally would not find the VBXE hardware, or would say the core was wrong or missing or whatever. You. So that completely ties in with the idea that this signal was intermittent, and half the time it wasn't connected, and half the time it was connected. But anyway, I'm 99.9% .9 certain that that was the problem, or the main problem. I'm not saying that the, the weird antic socket with no frame on it that was a funny height, different pin heights and stuff. Um, I think that was definitely worth fixing, replacing. And very often with things like that, it's an, it's an accumulation of lots of different problems. I mean, <laughs> let's face it, if I'd noticed this problem three, four days ago, fixed it, I would have still had to replace the cable as well, because the, the cable fell off, of course, as you saw. Okay, so now, when I switch this on, I fully expect it to completely work. Which it does. And we don't lose the video at the end of the repeater's boot screen. And everything appears to work perfectly well. So what I wanted to do, since I don't often have a repeater's machine on the desk here, is just run a few tests and I might as well use the Side 3 cartridge, because I'm working on that thing. Best part of the time. 
and see what uh, what the machine can do and what it can't uh, stably at 20 megahertz so if we go to the repeaters menu here i've got it set up in the stock Uh, repeaters configuration and uh, so I'm not going to make any changes there I'm going to come back out of it back into the loader and uh, I'm going to try some basic things here so we're running at 20 megahertz now one thing I have noticed here which I don't have a solution to and may well be my fault uh, is that when I try to run the command processor using the um, the fast XEX loader and that's the one that doesn't use a, a sector buffer it kind of abuses the uh, just as it did with the the side two cartridge we don't really want to have a 512 byte sector buffer in the bottom of memory when we're loading xex's because that's going to increase the size of the loader quite a bit so we just grab what bytes we need from the uh, the sd card controller's internal buffer and handle the, the sector transitions and boundaries um, outside of that all xex files are loaded in that manner so it's not peculiar to this uh, particular file now this file because we've got we have a look at the cluster size here uh, these are 32k clusters which is 64 uh, 512 byte sectors so when we load this particular file there's no cluster transition whatsoever we've got the first cluster number so we're just loading 22 contiguous sectors um, into memory um, so that it's very difficult to see where this fails but if I press enter on here and try and run this file it completely craps out. It never got as far as finding the run address uh, because I think that uh, particular executable sets the run address at the end of the binary. So it failed um, before it got there. Uh, I tried a few different XEX files and of course if the XEX file does set the, if it gets as far as setting the run address, it does attempt to run it and it crashes because it's failed to load the file properly. Now I've been through the code there's nothing in there that is uh, peculiar to the 6502C. It doesn't use any illegal opcodes, anything like that. It's something about the timing. I don't know. There's something about it which the 65C816 uh, doesn't like. Now, if I go into wherever it was, I put the copy of the command processor, if I can find it. Uh, look for the file here. There we go. So I made a copy of the um, command process and I gave it a com uh, suffix. Now com files and exe files are loaded using the slow uh, xex loader. Now the reason that's that change has been made here, so that the slow xex loader is basically the uh, the xio uh, accessible binary loader that's in the file management system that is installed when you run an executable and the reason I've made that change is because things like Turbo Basic XL actually call the CIO to load themselves into memory and that would never work using the fast XEX loader uh, previous versions of the loader there wasn't really much point in uh, running Turbo Basic XL because the file system was read only but now of course it's it's useful to do this and uh, Turbo Basic XL will run uh, from this loader. Uh, now if I run the COM version uh, that failed as well this time. <laughs> that's hilarious. <laughs> oh god that's hilarious. Now this usually works but in, in this case it hasn't so I think uh, this in say it did work that time. So I think what we've got here we've got a little bit of instability with IO at 20 megahertz. I have tried things at the slower speed in classic mode which does work perfectly well on this machine uh, and things do tend to work at stock speeds so there's something and it's not a, an OS incompatibility either I've tested the stock operating system at 20 megahertz that's not that problem so I mean two minds I, I don't want to sort of wear myself out trying to find bugs where no bugs may exist it may just be that I'm running around in circles trying to stabilize this thing uh, where it might not be possible to do so. So we have managed to get into the command processor anyway on this particular occasion. Most of the time it does work when it's using the, the, the slower uh, loader if you like. And um, 
So if we go back to the uh, root directory, we should be able to find. Right, so we've got RW test. So I'm going to run RW test. We're going to see what kind of I/O speeds we get. Occasionally, this will have an error. Uh, error one six two. I forget what that is. Anyway, this this file management system issues um, standard kinds of errors. So as you can see here, we get 218 uh, kilobytes per second writes, 356 kilobytes per second reads uh, for an average of 287 kilobytes per second. Of course, this is all running from RAM, uh, hence we get this excellent speed boost. Um, I'd be a little bit worried about doing any serious work on this since we are obviously getting the occasional um, I.O. error or certainly read errors. And I have seen, as I say, this has sometimes failed with error 162 which indicates um, probably a write error now I did also run uh, RWCRC I've had mixed results there sometimes it completes without errors sometimes it does get errors uh, and if it does get errors actually it usually fails actually right in the file out so we've got some stability problems uh, here and interestingly enough I've just checked and I've already stuck a 74F08 chip in this machine. Um, I should I should have tested it without that uh, swap, actually. I, I did that swap when I was desperately trying to figure out what was wrong with this machine. Uh, so I should have probably put the LS08 in. But I wouldn't have thought the F08 would make things worse. At least I would hope not anyway. So it will continue like this. So I'll, I'll put that in as a caveat that I did change a chip on the machine. Uh, it might have made things better in some respects, it might have made things worse in others. So we're back in the loader. Now I did find what I found very, very useful about this machine, particularly now that it works and now that I noticed that some of the loader behaviours were the same regardless of whether repeaters was even present in the machine or not, uh, is that I managed to fix some, um, some bugs in the loader. Um, one of them concerned um, command 12 that was being sent to the card. It was a kind of a hangover from the previous version of the loader, which didn't use a sector buffer, as I've mentioned before. Uh, that's not needed now, and removing that uh, preemptive command 12, which stops the data stream when you're doing multiple sector reads, which we need for DME, uh, when loading cartridges, uh, does seem to have really improved compatibility with these bigger uh, SD cards, these SanDisk ones, so that's good. Then there was another bug as well, which was newly introduced, which had me climbing the walls for a while because I was getting error FF. And at no point in the uh, software, well, so I thought, was uh, the error uh, reporting dialog called with uh, FF in the Y register, but I did eventually find it anyway. So that was a real uh, red herring wild goose chase. But that's fixed now anyway. So I think we should test a couple of cartridges. So we're still at 20 megahertz. Uh, now, so now we get this new uh, dialog. We've got a ROM file. Uh, the loader makes a best guess about what kind of um, cartridge it might be. This one's just a standard flat 16k cartridge. There we go. There's Abracadabra. And then we go back in here, and then we can try asteroids. So there's asteroids. And we go back in again. And we'll try Ace of Aces, which is a car file, so it doesn't need to ask you what type it is. And that all works perfectly well. So there's cartridges. They are working with repeaters at 20 megahertz. Great, excellent. So another thing I wanted to show you, another little test we can do is if we copy a big file here. So we'll go into the menu, we'll go, we could copy, you can tag files, you can in fact, you can copy the whole directory tree if you want to, if you feel like waiting around for it to complete. But we'll copy one file, which is 13 megabytes. We'll go into a test folder here. This one will do. It's empty. And I did make a quick change just specifically for this video, actually. The ROM, uh, the I.O. loops for the, the internal loader file system were in ROM. I've stuck them in RAM just so we're going to get some sort of a speed boost that we, that we can enjoy a little bit. So we'll paste this file here. And we'll watch it proceed. So yeah, just this afternoon when I was feeling a bit more cheerful because I'd fixed a few different things. I'd fixed this machine and I'd fixed a bug in the loader. Uh, I decided to add this thing here, which is quite fun. Um, and it gives you an idea how much time is left uh, for the copy operation. Because when you um, 
when you've marked a set of files or one file uh, and you copy them it writes the whole uh, the whole tree to a file on the card so in so doing it's able to inspect the size of the file so we know the size of the copy operation every file in it before we begin so that enables us to do some nice little calculations with the progress bar uh, we know how much data we've got to copy uh, we know how much we've done we know how much is left and we can work out how quickly uh, we're getting through the data now with repeaters here at 20 megahertz we're getting about uh, 96k or thereabouts throughput we're probably running about 200k a second reads i'm using a mixture of dma here because we haven't got dma right implemented yet unfortunately uh, that's another story um but we've got dma reads anyway and i'm trying to use them where i can so this is a fairly nice brisk uh piece of copying and while i've been talking here we've nearly finished Without repeaters, when you're running at uh, 1.7 megahertz, uh, surprisingly enough, it's about 48k a second, typically. Uh, although it's going to depend on the cluster size and all sorts of other geometrical and environmental factors. But there we go. So I'm not even going to I'm not even going to inspect this file and see if it copied properly. I've done enough work on this machine, I think, so far. If it copies without any errors, we'll look at the uh, file properties and uh, we'll call that a success, I think. And there we go so if we go into the menu now and we can get info and we can see that it's a 13 megabyte file and it's got the timestamp and uh, this the driver sets the uh, archive attribute i don't know if that's something that will uh, make its way into the final build but anyway so there we go now i might as well before i forget show you something else i'll put the lid on this computer because i think it's basically done now what i probably mentioned earlier on is that this has now got a uh, an aki keyboard interface usb keyboard interface built into it and uh so i've plugged a wireless keyboard into it a wireless keyboard receiver and it works perfectly fine it's great so uh, let's play with a uh, wireless logitech keyboard and show you what that's like you need a bigger desk you know right so here logitech wireless keyboard so yeah it does it works just like the original one um this is the aki designed by candlo sin uh, available at lotharic and all resellers yeah it works really good to shift and con yeah shift and control narrow keys working well uh you've got reset on uh, f5 and i think you've got your other console keys there as well works really good and obviously you could be right at the other end of the room if you wanted and uh use the loader like that so yeah I, I highly recommend it actually uh really good and i always like this keyboard the only thing i didn't like about it is that the uh the, the letters start to wear off the keys which is why i ended up getting the uh the mx keys one for the pc but uh yes this is very very good indeed i really like this and of course the the internal keyboard works at the same time as well so uh, what could be better than that so I think this machine is now quite well equipped, but my, it certainly had its share of problems. Right, the owner has asked me to, since there's no port B RAM expansion in this machine, what the owner has asked me to do is set up the, uh, the R core, which will give him an extra 256k uh, of port B RAM. So I think they call it, do they call it the Rambo one now? Right, well, we're going to set the boot bank to that one now and we'll see if we get our extra ram right so is that it do i have to do anything else or is that done right well let's hope it is we'll do it we'll do a power cycle right so i've booted into the um i think i'll swap cards actually i'm sure there's an apt partition on the other one might be a bit of a better idea Ah, there we go. So we've got some files on the hard disk here. We've got RW test. Shall we try RW test before we go any further? Yeah, let's do it. So this is what we're going to get from Spartados X at uh, 20 megahertz. If you remember from the tests I did in the uh, the loaders file management system, this is well, it was nearly about twice as fast as this. But in fairness to Spartados X, it doesn't use multi-sector clusters. So with 32 uh, key clusters in FAT32, you can really uh, write data out very very quickly and read it back again so it's 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 not particularly surprising that this is a bit slower 
in any case uh, let's have a look at the mem now mem x i believe should give us so we've got 16 megabytes of linear ram for the 65 c 16 there we go we've got 16 banks good so that's the port b ram we've got our 256k of extra ram which is what the user wanted. What I'll also check is that the SVBXA driver works properly and detects the hardware. I've got absolutely no doubt that it will work perfectly well now. That's another thing the owner was having a problem with. Half the time the driver wouldn't detect VBXE properly and we know that that's because the D6 signal wasn't properly connected to the VBXE board. Mystery solved. So I think I'll leave that there just so that this video doesn't get completely out of hand. Um, I'm quite pleased to see the uh, side three cartridge working reasonably well uh, with Rapidus at fully accelerated speeds. Maybe there's a couple of things I can fix with that XEX load and not want it to work properly. But there's some stability now, possibly directly relevant to that is that Lotharic is apparently going to send out uh, one of his SRAM boards, which replaces all the base memory on the machine. Uh, but they haven't arrived yet and he told me that and I'm, and I'm thinking it's probably exactly things like this funny little stability errors and that sort of stuff it remains to be seen what will happen they haven't arrived yet unfortunately otherwise i would have definitely tried it in this video but they ain't here yet so and i don't know when they're going to come either and i don't want to have this i'm i'm finding it very useful to have this machine on the bench from the perspective of uh testing side three with as many different machines as I can but I don't want it to be here forever so uh, we'll see what happens and if I do find any if I find that the SRAM board doesn't make a big difference with this machine if it arrives in time I'll make a little update video because that's probably something people will want to know about we're going to go out tonight because it's Easter Sunday I'm just relieved I was managed to be able to get this video filmed because it's been going on for three days now and I think I've got something I can edit down now. I hope I didn't forget anything that I wanted to put in this video. But I think I've got everything. It's been quite the saga this machine. I hope you enjoyed what I was able to share here with you about it. And uh, if you enjoyed the video, do give it a like. Share it if you feel like it. And if you want to see more stuff like this, do subscribe to the channel. I've got Patreon links, coffee links, PayPal links. And thank you very much uh, to the uh, new patron. Uh, Paul Barker who uh, signed up the other day uh, thank you very much Paul for your support I've met Paul before he's a lovely chap so yeah I'm pretty much in a hurry to get started editing this video down get it out for Easter Monday and then you can uh, hopefully enjoy watching it so thank you very much indeed uh, and happy Easter to you all and with a bit of luck I will see you in the next video so bye bye for now Right, so as far as this um, dead VBXE is concerned, um, I noticed that there's a dead short to ground across this capacitor here, C15, which is right next to what I think is one of the voltage regulators, I'm assuming. And I think the input is this pin here, and now that's short straight to the cap, and it's also short to ground uh, and on the other regulator here. So if we've got, I'm assuming this is ground this side. So we've got 403 ohms to ground on the input on that regulator and on this regulator we've got pretty much zero ohms to ground 403 ohms on the other regulator which i'm assuming is a good one so is this blown up i don't know uh maybe explains why everything gets hot when it's switched on um but i don't think an avr flash or anything is going to fix this one so there you go